Here's an overview of the sacrum. We're going to talk about the different ways that osteopathic physicians refer to the sacrum and all of its little tiny parts. So at the top of the sacrum, we have the sacral base, and there's a sacral base that is technically on either side, and you see drawn in red here, I'm labeling what's referred to as the sacral sulcus. So there are two sacral sulci, right? Sulci is the plural of sulcus. There are two sacred sul sacral sulci, one on each side, and together the top part of the sacrum is the sacral base. All right, so once we're comfortable with that, one more time, we've got two sacral sulci, or a sacral sulcus on the right and a sacral sulcus on the left. The entire top part or superior portion of the sacrum is referred to as the sacral base. Now, let's talk about these little pink guys down here. These are the inferior lateral angles, also known as the ILA. So if I say ILA, I'm talking about the inferior lateral angle. There's, of course, one on either side of the sacrum, both on the right and the left. So that's our sacrum. Now, if you have gotten through lesson five, I told you that there are two really important axes that you have to be familiar with. They are the right oblique axis and the left oblique axis. Here is a right oblique axis. The way that you call the axis is about which corner it goes through on the top. So if it goes through the top right corner, it's a right oblique axis. And here's a left oblique axis where it goes through the top left corner. So whichever top corner you go through, that's how you name it, right or left. So we're going to talk about sacral mechanics right now and get into some somatic dysfunctions. So when we talk about a sacral torsion, we name it for rotation on axis. So for example, a right on left sacral torsion means that we have a right rotation on a left axis. It's always rotation first and then axis second. So right on left means right rotation on left axis. Keep that in mind because that's how they're gonna be named on Comlex. So here's our sacrum. And I'm gonna show you an example of a right on left sacral torsion. So, Cause you need to get familiar mentally with how the sacrum moves and how these somatic dysfunctions are named. So it's a right rotation on a left axis. So first let's draw on our axis. This is our left axis. You should be comfortable with this because I showed you what an, a left axis meant. So we're going through the top left corner. Now the sacrum is rotating to the right. After you draw in your, your axis, there's only two ways that it can rotate it. You can either rotate to the right or rotate to the left. So in this case, it's rotating to the right. And I've drawn in the arrow here showing you the motion arc of how that sacrum is gonna move. Now, just to contrast it, this would be a left rotation. So if we're rotating to the left, it's kind of going deep into the page here on a 2D image. But if we're rotating to the right, the sacrum is gonna rotate to the right and it'll be more superficial. That, that sacral sulcus will become more superficial. So see how I'm using the anatomic terms and hopefully you get comfortable with that. So we now have a right rotation on a left axis. So the black is where the sacrum started and now we're gonna move and I'm gonna show you in orange what the sacrum is moving towards. So here's what we have now. The sacrum is pivoting about that left axis and it's rotating towards the right. So when it does that, we need to ask ourselves, how does the sacral sulcus move and how does the ILA move? So we're particularly interested in the right sacral sulcus and the left ILA because as you see here, they're the ones with the predominant motion. So how does the right sacral sulcus change if we're rotating to the right? Well, it became more shallow. And how does the left ILA move? Well, it became more deep. And these are how the findings will be presented to you on Comlex and how they'll be presented to you in your medical school final examinations. You have to know your findings. You have to know shallow and deep for sacral sulci and ILAs. You have to know how to draw in your axes. There are some more important rules that you need to be aware of. So let's talk about those. So in a torsion, the axis is always opposite the seated flexion test. So let's just pause here for a second. In lesson five, we talked about the standing flexion test. A positive standing flexion test told us that there was innominate somatic dysfunction, but a positive seated flexion test tells us that there's a sacral somatic dysfunction. And that's where it's really important to make the distinction. So in sacral somatic dysfunctions, your axis is always opposite the side that the seated flexion test is positive on. So if we do a seated flexion test and it's positive on the right, that means our axis is a left axis. 
If we do a seated flexion test and it's positive on the left, that tells us that our axis is a right axis. So it's always opposite, the axis that is, is always opposite the side that the seated flexion test is positive on. Now, there's a relationship between L5 and the sacrum, and it goes like this. L5 will always side bend to the same side that the sacral axis is on. L5 will always rotate to the opposite side that the sacral rotation is occurring. So the lumbosacral spring test will be positive anytime the sacral base, which recall is the top part of the sacrum, anytime that moves posterior or becomes more shallow, you'll have a positive lumbosacral spring test. Additionally, on any sacral base that moves anterior, that is to say that goes deeper since it's moving anteriorly, positive springing. So these are slightly lower yield findings, but nonetheless, you should be aware of them. So what I want you to do is take a second, and when I'm done talking, you're gonna pause the video here and just understand and try to memorize how these rules work, specifically the relationship between L5 dysfunctions and sacral rotation and axes. So pause the video and memorize this because we're going to do an example that will require you to know all of these rules. If you're ready for the example, let's go on. So the example we were talking about was a right rotation on a left axis. So we're talking about a right on left sacral torsion somatic dysfunction. Here's how it's moving in space. I'm going to ask you some questions now. Which side will the seated flexion test be positive on? Well, the seated flexion test will be positive on the right because the seated flexion test is always positive on the side opposite the axis. And because we have a left axis, we must therefore have a right seated flexion positive test. Now, which way will L5 rotate? Well, L5 is going to rotate to the left because L5 rotates opposite the way that the sacrum rotates. And since it's named right on left, we know that the sacrum is rotating to the right. If the sacrum rotates to the right, L5 always rotates opposite, which means it rotates to the left. Which way does L5 side bend? L5 is going to side bend to the left. I told you that L5 will always side bend to the same side that the sacral axis is on. And since this is a left axis, L5 will side bend to the left. And then the last question, which requires a little bit of thinking, how do you name the dysfunction at L5 if it gets better in the sphinx position? Well, if it gets better in the sphinx position, that's another way of saying that it prefers extension. So we name it extended, side bent, and rotated to the left. This is exactly how the questions will present themselves to you on Comlex. You're going to be given a whole list of findings. You're going to be told which ILA is deeper posterior, which sacral sulcus is deep or superficial, blah, 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 a bunch of findings. And then you're going to have to figure out the how to write the dysfunction. So you got to figure out which way is it rotating and which axis is it on. And then once you have that, you're going to have to take it a step further and find out what the dysfunction at L5 is based on rules for rotation and rules for side bending. There's a lot of moving parts here and it does require a lot of attention to detail. So go through that example one more time if you need some more practice, but it's extremely, extremely high yield. Torsions show up on Comlex all the time. Please know how to do this. Now we're gonna talk about something a little bit different. We just talked about torsions, which is a rotation on an axis. But now we're going to talk about something called flexions and extensions. So there are different types of flexions and extensions. And here I've drawn three different um, sacrums for you. You can have a unilateral flexion where you have one side of the sacrum flexing and the other side's not moving at all. So when that happens, you need to also, just like with torsions, you need to also ask yourself, what's happening to my landmarks? How is the sacral base or the sacral sulcus moving? How is the ILA moving? So let's do this example. Let's say that you have a right-sided sacral flexion. What changes? Pause the video if you need a second to think about it. But we're gonna go through this now. You're gonna have the right sacral sulcus or the right sacral base will be deep because the right side is the side that's flexing. So that just makes perfect sense. The right ILA will be shallow because the top is flexing but the bottom where the ILA is becomes more shallow. 
the left side is totally unchanged. And because the right base moved anteriorly, we're going to have springing positive over the right base. What if we have a bilateral flexion? You can have one side flex, as you see in this example, but if you have a bilateral flexion, as you see in this middle example here, how do things change? Again, pause the video if you need a second, but let's go through this. In this case, both sacral sulcuses, or both sacral sulci, I should say, are going to become deep, and both ILAs will be shallow. You'll have springing positive at both bases because both of them moved anterior and both of them became more deep. Our third example is going to be a unilateral sacral extension, as you see here. Only on one side will you be extending posteriorly. So how do our landmarks change here? Well, the right sacral sulcus will become shallow. It's more superficial now. But the right ILA is now deep because the bottom part of the sacrum where the ILA is is now deeper, relatively speaking, than the top. Springing will be restricted at both sacral bases because now we have a unilateral flexion and springing will be restricted. There will be a positive spring test, however. These findings you want to keep in mind as you move through all of these examples of flexions and extensions. But bottom line, you want to know that you can have a unilateral or bilateral flexion or extensions. So practice a little bit with these. They're a little bit lower yield than torsions, but nonetheless, they do show up from time to time. So be comfortable working through them. In flexions and extensions, you want to know that in a bilateral flexion or extension, the seated flexion test is a false negative. So let's kind of go through this. The seated flexion test will localize to one side that has the dysfunction. But when both sides are flexed or extended, you can't appreciate a difference between the right side of the sacrum and the left side of the sacrum. So even though you have bilateral flexion or bilateral extension, you as the physician who are palpating when you do the seated flexion test can't appreciate a difference because even though there's a dysfunction, both sides of the sacrum are moving together bilaterally in a flexion or extension. So what's high yield to know is that in a bilateral flexion or extension, you have a false negative seated flexion test, despite the fact that there is somatic dysfunction. So please keep that in mind. The last thing I want to touch on really quickly is treatment. When a uh, rotation on the axis is occurring to the same side, you put them in the SIMS positions. So for example, if you had a left on left torsion, left and left are the same side, so they would be in the SIMS position. Um, on the other hand, if rotation on axis was occurring in opposite directions, they would be on their back. So the O's match up there just like the S's do. And of course, rotation on axis occurring in opposite directions, an example would be a right on left torsion or a left on right torsion. So anytime they're occurring to opposite directions, they're going to be on their back. Anytime they're occurring to the same direction, you put them in the sims position. But that wraps up everything that you need to know about sacral dysfunctions. In summary, the highest yield thing from this entire lecture were sacral torsions. So go back and make sure that you're able to understand how rotation and axis work, how you can understand which way that the sacrum is moving, and make sure that you understand the relationship between L5 dysfunctions, right, the way that L5 rotates in side bends, versus the findings that they'll give you about the way that the sacrum moves. Those relationships are super high yield, and I don't want you guys to miss what will be free points on test day if you just take a little bit of time and learn these rules.